We are currently looking at our Savior as he is seen in Hebrews chapter 1. So please take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Today we're looking at verse 4 and uh, verses 4 and 5. Last time we looked at verse 3. As we've been looking at this, we're seeing that Jesus is better than the prophets. He is the heir and the creator of the world. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of God's nature. He is upholding all things by the word of his power. He made purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God's majesty. And now as we look at verse 4, we see that he is better than the angels. Notice what verse 4 says. Having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Notice that the writer here says that he is better than the angels. And now he introduces us to these wonderful creatures of God. I don't know if you've ever taken some time to study about these wonderful creatures. In the world in which we live, we find all kinds of views about angels. Some believe in them, some do not believe in them. Some that do believe in them want to say that they're all female. I contest to you that none of them are female. That they're all male. Masculine gender is used of them. We have Michael and we have Gabriel, the only two that are mentioned by name. That's not Gabrielle and that's not Michelle. Michael and Gabriel. Some people get their theology about angels from that popular TV show that used to air years ago called Touched by an Angel. Remember that? Still is a popular show, right? Well, people get their theology from TV, and you shouldn't get your theology from TV. You should get your theology from the Bible, from the Word of God. So this morning, we're going to look at, at angels, and we're going to see how this unfolds in this passage in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4. In his book, Angels, God's Secret Agents, Billy Graham states this about angels. He says, I am convinced that these heavenly beings exist and that they provide unseen aid on our behalf. I do not believe in angels because someone has told me about a dramatic visitation from an angel, impressive as such rare testimonies may be. I do not believe in angels because UFOs are astonishingly angel-like in some of their reported appearances. I do not believe in angels because ESP experts are making the realm of the spirit world seem more and more plausible. I do not believe in angels because of the sudden worldwide emphasis on the reality of Satan and demons. I do not believe in angels because I have ever seen one because I haven't. I believe in angels because the Bible says there are angels and I believe the Bible to be the true word of God. And amen, I believe that too. I've never experienced a personal encounter with an angel, though we're told in Hebrews that to be careful how we entertain strangers because you might be entertaining an angel. But the Bible says here in verse 4 that there are angels. And it mentions them just as a fact. And when it talks about there being angels, it says in comparison to Jesus, Jesus is better than the angels. And the word better means far better. It means excellent. It means superior. More prominent. He's more prominent than angels. But we can say from this passage, angels exist. In fact, you can't read the book of Revelation without encountering angels. In fact, one person said if you removed all the mention of angels, you'd be left just to chapter headings in the book of Revelation because they're mentioned almost in every chapter of Revelation. But angels do exist, and the Jews held angels in a very high regard as the highest beings next to God. The fact that Angels exist is as certain as a fact that God exists. In fact, in the Bible we say that the Bible doesn't seek out to prove the existence of God, it assumes it. It states it as a fact. The same is true about anything else we read in the Bible. When we learn about Jesus from the Old Testament or the New Testament, it doesn't seek out to prove Him or to prove His existence. It assumes His existence, that He exists. Same with the Holy Spirit. Same with angels. 
34 books of the Bible make reference to angels. You have 17 in the Old Testament, 17 in the New Testament. So with that many mentions, there are angels. Angels exist. They recognize this. In fact, if you were to go to chapter 12 of Hebrews and look at verse 22, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. Myriads. That term literally means 10,000, but here it actually denotes countless thousands of of angels. We don't know exactly how many there are, but we know when Satan fell, he took a third of them with him, and a third of countless angels is obviously a lot. These are what we term as demons, fallen angels. Also in Revelation 5:11, you have the repetition of the term myriads, which suggests the number of angels being countless. So if somebody asks you in the Bible how many angels are there, you just say there are countless angels. There's an unnumbered amount of angels. And if God wanted us to know how many there were, He would have told us how many there were. Right? But we know they exist because the Bible says that they exist and there's a countless number of them. The Bible also says that angels were created. They are creatures created by God. Hebrews 1.7, look down at verse 7. It says, God makes, and the word makes is a word that means to create, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. He created them as winds, as a flame of fire. Psalm 148 verse 2 and following tells us, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. God created the angels for His own glory. In fact, Colossians 1.16 tells us, when Jesus created everything, He created the angels. Listen to what it says. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. And that phrase, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, that is a reference to the categories or the ranks of angels. Just as you read in Ephesians chapter 6, it mentions the categories and the ranks of fallen angels, demons. But the statement here in Colossians 1.16, it points out a singular act. In other words, the act of creating angels does not continue. He created them all at one time. We don't know exactly at what point in the creation that he did that, but we know he did it all at one time. And there are thousands upon thousands, innumerable. You can't number all of them, just as if you could count the stars or number the stars. It's just like trying to figure out how many angels there are. But not only were they created, but they were created to do something. One we see in the Psalms I just read, they were created to praise Him. Just like you and I were created to praise Him. And if you're not praising Him, or you're waiting to praise Him when you get here, you've divested yourself from your purpose. God has created you for His glory, to glorify Him forever. So everything you do should be running through the grid of glorifying Him and praising Him. So an attitude that you may adopt during the day or somebody may make you mad or something, how you respond, will that give God praise? Will that give God glory? Or will it bring more attention to yourself and you look more like a fool? Angels are spirits, first of all. They are ministering spirits, Hebrews says. They are winds. They're flames of fire, not literally the flames of fire, but they have that power. But they are actually spirit beings. They can possess a body. They can take on some type of physical form, obviously a human form, because you remember when the women came to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus after he had died and they placed him in the tomb. First of all, they were reasoning among themselves, who's going to move the stone away? And they came and they found the stone already moved away. And one of the gospel writer says that there were two of them there and they were in dazzling garments they were obviously in some kind of human form 
for them to be able to identify them. They take on a form of a man. So they are spirits, but they also do God's bidding. They do what God says. And the whole problem with Lucifer or Satan, the son of the morning, you read in Isaiah 14, his whole problem was he didn't want to keep doing what God said. In fact, he wanted to be like God. He wanted to exalt himself above God, and God cast him down. The whole point of hell was not created for man. It was created for the devil and his angels, fallen demons. But yet, if man chooses to reject the free gift of salvation that God offers, he will spend eternity in hell. But they do God's bidding. Again, they're called ministers. Look at that in verse 4. He says that he has become better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. And then he mentions down in verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits? Ministering spirits. What is a ministering spirit? What is one who ministers but one who serves? One who gives a message. One who does what someone else is telling him to do. The Hebrew word that's used for angels is melach, and it simply means messenger. And it could refer to a human messenger or a divine messenger. But the basic meaning of the word is one who is sent. And as a divine messenger, an angel is a heavenly being charged by God with some kind of commission. They're charged to give a message. They're charged to carry out the acts of God, whatever that act may be. The word is found 103 times in the Old Testament. Now you have the Greek word angelos that is found in the New Testament. It occurs 175 times, and it's only used of men six times. The rest of the times it's used to speak of these heavenly beings. And that word, angelos, is very similar to the Hebrew word in that it also means messenger as one who speaks, one who acts in the place of the one who has sent him. Angels do God's bidding. They do God's will. And by the way, they do it perfectly. God does not tolerate disobedience among the ranks. So they are ministering spirits. They are spirit beings created by God to minister to Him. Also to minister to us. If you go back there to Hebrews and look there at verse 14. Are not they all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? It's talking about every believer. Because as I said, when we entertain strangers as... Hebrews 13 mentions we have to make sure that when we're entertaining them when we're ministering to them we don't want to neglect them we don't want to neglect to show hospitality to them Hebrews 13 2 for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it I think of the three people that came to Abraham the Bible reveals that one of them was the Lord which would then would have to be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. The other two that went to Sodom to destroy it were angels. They're very powerful beings. Very powerful. So they exist. They were created. There's myriads upon myriads of angels. They're ministering spirits that do God's bidding. But notice also that Angels are subjected to Jesus. They're subjected to Him. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And this is in the garden when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. You remember this? Right before He was taken and crucified on the cross and right before the trial, they arrested Him. And as they went to do this, Peter pulls out his sword... And he cuts off the ear of the slave of the high priest, Malcolm. Cuts his ear off. But I want you to hear what Jesus says. Not only put that away, but he says something else here. It says in Matthew 26, 51, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword, 
struck the slave of the high priest, cut off his ear, and then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Now notice this. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? In a Roman legion, there were 6,000 to one Roman legion. There's 12,000 here. So how many angels are you talking about? 72,000 angels he could have called on. In fact, he only needed to call on one. You read in the Old Testament where one angel wiped out the Assyrian army. But they are powerful beings. And they're subject to Christ. Why is that? Because He's God. He created them. You and I are subject to Christ. They are called by other names. Job 1.6 calls them sons of God. Psalm 89.5 calls them holy ones. Psalm 89.6 calls them the host. And many times when you hear them called host, it's talking about the armies of heaven. But notice also that we're told that Jesus was lower than the angels for a time. This is before His exaltation, before His ascension back to the Father. After His resurrection, when He appeared to Mary, you remember in John 20, 15, you remember she was clinging to Him, and He said, Stop clinging to Me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. She was holding on to Him. He hadn't yet been glorified. And He made her stop. But it says in Hebrews 1.4, He is better than the angels. He might for a time been lower than the angels in His incarnation, but He is better, more superior than the angels. And when it says there, having become, it refers to a change of state, not a change of existence. Yes, there's cults out there that believe that Jesus is an angel. Jesus is not an angel. He created the angels. As we've said in the Old Testament, you have the angel of Yahweh. When you study the angel of Yahweh, that, I would conclude, would be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ because of the things that He was able to do, because of He acting just like God and having the very power that God has. And, of course, He disappears when you come into the New Testament. But Jesus is better. He is superior to the angels. And again, Jews reading this would have understood it. Many Jews have had trouble throughout time with Jesus being the Messiah. In fact, there are people today that do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still looking for their Messiah. The only problem is they're going to have a hard time proving that He is the Messiah because the point of the genealogies in Matthew 1 and Luke give us His rightful place to the throne of David. And all the genealogical records were destroyed in 70 A.D., so they're going to have a hard time trying to prove that whoever this guy is that comes on the scene that they believe is the Messiah is truly the Messiah. Jews were very into genealogies. And as I said, they were destroyed. Now I want you to notice the second thing that we find here. There in Hebrews, he says not only... Has he become better, superior than the angels? But it says he has inherited a more excellent name than they. A more excellent name. What is their name? Now, I'm not talking about their name like Michael and Gabriel. I'm talking more about their identification. They're identified as messengers. Essentially, we could say that they're servants. They're identified as servants. They serve us. They serve believers. They serve God. Remember the word angelos? Remember the word malach? It means messenger. One who speaks and acts in the place of the one who has sent him. And by the way, no angels is sovereign Lord. Uh, look at verse 6. And when he again brings the firstborn in the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. They're called to worship Him. We're not to worship the angels in Colossians. The book of Colossians, the group behind that, either the Gnostic or the Essenes, 
they believed in angel worship. Catholic Church today believes in angel worship. We're, not, we're told not to do that. In fact, when the Apostle John fell down before the angel who was disclosing all these visions to him in the book of Revelation, the angel said, Get up! Worship God! I think he was a little confused there with all this, these visions that he was seeing there, what was to take place. And all he could do was fall down and worship. But angels are not to be worshipped. Saints are not to be worshipped. In fact, many times the term saint is a little too much for us, right? <laughs> but the word itself just simply means holy ones. And I know you look at your life and you say, well, I'm far from that. Well, your designation before God is that you're holy. He made you holy. Look also at verse 13, chapter 1. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? He never said that to any angel. There he's talking about the inheritance of Christ, like in Psalm chapter 2. That Jesus Christ is the heir. As I said last week, Revelation, the entire book of Revelation is dealing with the fact that Jesus is the rightful heir. He is the rightful heir to the title deed of the earth. And what you have in the book of Revelation is, is Him taking that rightful place. No angel is sovereign Lord. No angel is to be worshipped. No angel can save you. Only Jesus can save you. Jesus is the only one, His only name given among men whereby you must be saved, Acts 4.12. Jesus Himself self said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. So that's very exclusive. So what is this name that he's talking about? He says there he has inherited a more excellent name. Well, you can get a little bit more from this if you just look in the passage itself. Go back to verse 2. It tells us in these last days God has spoken to us by His what? Son. By His Son. Look at verse 5. To which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Jesus is referred to here as the son. But he was never called the son until his incarnation. What's the incarnation? Well, the incarnation is the word becoming flesh. Jesus becoming flesh. Jesus taking on a body as John 1.14 talks about before he took on that body, he was always God, eternal God. You remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the Word. John is the only one that uses that term about him. He is God. Jesus said it himself in John 8.58, before Abraham was, I am claimed to be the I am of Exodus 3.14. They understood exactly what he meant because they picked up stones to stone him because they said for him to say that about himself, he was making himself out to be God, and they called that blasphemy. You are my son. He never said that of the angels, but he said that of Jesus. He said that of Jesus. R.C. Sproul says, The eternal Son took on a human nature to rescue us from sin and death. Having for a time voluntarily taken a position lower than the angels, He is now, in His resurrection and ascension, declared to be the Son of God in power to save His people. Christ's exaltation thus inaugurates a new phase of His messianic and redemptive sonship and gives Him a dignity far above that of angels. He is superior to angels. And again, the writer of Hebrews is pointing that out, his superiority. He is superior to the prophets, verse 1. He is heir. He is the one who made or created the worlds, or literally the ages. He's the radiance of God's glory. Not only does he radiate God's glory, but he radiates his own glory, as in the transfiguration in Matthew 17. He is the exact representation or the exact imprint of God's nature, just as you would imprint something like they would have a signet ring and press it into the wax, and it would make an exact 
print of what was on the ring. Jesus is the exact reproduction of God, though He's not created, so be careful with those terms. He's always been. And He literally upholds or up, is upholding all things. Present tense is used there for the word upholds. He's upholding all things by the word of His power. And when he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's our Savior. That's our Savior. Superior. In fact, I keep saying that he's God. And uh, in Hebrews 1.8, it says it. Look at 1.8. But to the Son, he says. Who says? God is the one speaking. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of His kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, here He calls Him Lord now, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up, like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. He has an unchanging nature, like in Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. Unchangeable nature. He's called Lord in verse 10. He's called God in verse 8. He's God. And there, right there in Hebrews chapter 1, as we're looking at this, obviously there are other places I've mentioned to you in John 1.1, 1, 1, where he is called the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But listen to it in Hebrews, or rather Titus chapter 2. It says in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus refers to him as being our great God and Savior Christ Jesus the book of 1st John when it ends it says and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ get this this is the true God and eternal life who is Jesus Jesus is God Jesus is God, therefore He's superior. Superior to everyone and everything. His name is far more excellent than the angels. They are ministering spirits, but He is the Son of God. And again, the term Son, taking on that term at the Incarnation. Before the Incarnation, He wasn't referred to as the Son. But He became the Son. And just as verse 6 of Hebrews 1 says, and let all the angels of God worship Him, we should be worshiping Him, right? And I hope that you've been doing that this morning. He is worthy of our praise. Not only this morning, but every morning. Every day. Throughout the day. And I hope that this is not the only time that you worship Him, or this is not the only time that you pull out your Bible and read it, or study it, or the only time you pray. But this is something that's a habit of your life. Jesus is God. Jesus is the God-man. He is the Son of God. And of course, the simple question is this, do you know Him? Do you truly know Him as He has been presented in Scripture this morning? Do you know Him that way? We tell people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't always tell them who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We just assume they know. And many times people, when they respond to who Jesus is, they just refer to the cross. And there's nothing wrong with referring to the cross because that's what He came to do, right? But who is He? The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9 that you have to confess Him as Lord. The word confess, homilegeo, means to say the same thing. When you confess Him as Lord, you're saying the same thing the Bible says about Him. He is Lord. You're agreeing with what Scripture says. And you're believing in your heart what Scripture says. He is Lord and God raised Him from the dead. And you're believing also what Scripture says, that if you call upon Him, He'll save you. He'll change you. He'll transform your life. Tom gave me a hat last week, and it says, Forgiven. He, he came in one day wearing that hat. I love that hat, because that's exactly what the guy shared with me 
when he witnessed to me. He said, Steve, you need to be forgiven of all your sin. That has stuck with me 36 years, that phrase. You know, some people say, well, I don't remember everything that happened. Here. I remember everything that happened. I remember when the light came on. I remember when Christ opened my eyes and made me alive. God made me alive to Him. That you could know Him too. Call upon His name. Confess Him as Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. But you also have to renounce your sin. You have to get, quit clinging to that. You have to be willing to repent. Turn from it. That's a 180 turn. When it talks about the Thessalonians in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, it said that they turned to God from their idols to serve a living and true God. You have to turn to God from sin. So you can know Him. Over in Philippians chapter 2, there's another name that's used of Jesus. Listen to what it says. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord. Confessing now. Father, we thank you for this wonderful privilege, this wonderful opportunity to look at your word, to see our Savior as he is presented in your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, for every person in here that they know him, they know Jesus, they confess him as their Lord, not just the one time, but all the time. And they always confess their sin to him, our great advocate pleads on our behalf. If there's anyone in here that has not confessed Christ as Lord, Lord, may today be that day. May today be that moment when you regenerate them, when you save them, when you open up their eyes. Thank you for the truths that we have learned today and that we've been learning as we've looked here in chapter 1 of Hebrews. Jesus being superior to the prophets, Jesus being superior to the angels. We praise you and we thank you for that. A wonderful truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.